Keith Waddell's career and achievements remind the detached observer of great Christian missionaries and healers like Nobel Peace Prize winner Albert Schweitzer, though Keith himself, being a modest man, would categorically reject the comparison. For half a century, motivated both by his faith and by his calling as a doctor, he has brought healing, particularly of eye conditions, to people in Africa. Keith Waddle has Africa in his blood. His great-grandparents had migrated to the Cape in the late 19th century as farmers and as miners, and Keith himself was born in what was then Rhodesia. His teenage years, however, were spent in London, and he was educated at the University of Oxford, graduating in 1961 with the degrees, like those being awarded today, of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. He then completed his clinical training at St Bartholomew's Hospital in Southampton. But the prospect of a steady career as a hospital doctor or general practitioner in the UK, valuable though those things are, was clearly not going to be sufficient. In 1964, Keith was commissioned as a missionary by the African Inland Mission with the intention of serving in Congo. But that country was then engulfed in civil war and he was diverted to Uganda, which had gained its independence only two years previously. Congo's loss has been very much Uganda's gain. At this point, it is perhaps worth pausing to note that Uganda, to this day, is one of the poorest countries in the world, being ranked 178th out of 198 countries by gross domestic product. According to the World Health Organization, expenditure per capita on health is only about £21 a year. The comparable figure for the United Kingdom is £2,000. So there was no shortage of things for the young Dr Waddle to do. At first, he provided general medical assistance wherever it was needed. In 1970, he returned to the UK as a registrar at Barts, took a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene, and went back to Uganda in 1972, still as a general physician, but also as leprosy doctor for southwest Uganda. This was the period in which, thanks to new treatments, leprosy was effectively eliminated. But it was also the period in which Uganda was ruled by Idi Amin. Health services did not flourish, and new developments were virtually impossible. Keith, however, is not a man to ignore a challenge, and it had become apparent to him that he was constantly encountering eye conditions and blindness which were treatable and preventable, but for which there was no local provision. This is where the connection with Leicester began. In the immediate post-Armin era, he was invited to speak here, and he subsequently trained at the Leicester Royal Infirmary as an ophthalmic senior house officer. He returned to Uganda in 1982 and set up that country's first eye service, consisting of Keith, one assistant, a suitcase, travelling the country on the back of lorries. Originally, the emphasis of his work was on such conditions as cataracts, but it has never been enough for Keith simply to treat and move on. He saw it as critical to educate and to build up an infrastructure which could sustain the Ugandan eye service for the future. At first, this meant training village health workers and getting the patients to those people. Now, the service's main hospital is sufficiently advanced to be capable of training postgraduate specialist eye doctors. It is evidence of the success of his work that many of Keith's patients, orphans or from poor families, have gone on to train as nurses, health workers and in other professions. Indeed, as Keith himself has said, the assistant who hands me the instruments when I'm operating, I first met as a blind boy. In addition to cataracts, the conditions treated included allergic conjunctivitis and glaucoma. It is unremitting work. Keith quotes a Ugandan colleague, we are called medical experts, but the truth is we're medical next perts. Next patient, next patient, next patient, all day long. A Leicester friend and colleague who visited Keith last year described the work vividly. It was free eye week last week and the patients flooded in. Keith and his team operated on 368 people. Keith tends to see the difficult cases, primarily children, and personally operated on over 100. 12 hours a day in the operating theatre and he is 78 years old. 
Many of those seen have cataracts. And it is a wonder that 300 people who could barely distinguish night from day on Monday can now all see again at a cost of five euros per operation. As the work has developed, so the complexity of the conditions which Keith and his colleagues are tackling has increased. Retinoblastoma, an aggressive cancer affecting the eyes of young children, can generally be treated in the West, but was often fatal in Uganda because there was no capacity to follow up surgery with radiotherapy. Now, assisted by organizations in this country, including Cancer Research UK, health workers are increasingly able to reach patients in their distant villages and arrange for them to receive further hospital treatment if necessary. This has also involved clinical research, initiating the use of chemotherapy in Uganda for this condition. One of the many outstanding features of Keith's career has been his ability to balance clinical work in the most difficult conditions with highly regarded research, perhaps best reflected in the award of a Doctorate of Medicine by the University of Oxford for a study of the relationship between conjunctival carcinoma and HIV. Nor have his activities been limited to Uganda or to the purely medical. He and his team traveled to South Sudan, Rwanda, and, appropriately given his initial plans 50 years ago, to Congo. And his commitment to the general well-being and education of children is reflected in his Disadvantaged Youngsters project, now running for four decades, and in the naming of a community school for 200 children in his honor. He has also contributed to clinical teaching here in Leicester and to clinical service at the Royal Infirmary. All this work is underpinned by a deep and abiding faith and a recognition that Christ responded to phys people's physical needs as well as their spiritual ones. Appropriately, there was a service of thanksgiving for Keith last year at Ruharo Cathedral, followed by celebrations which included singing and dancing by 50 orphans and former patients whom Keith had assisted. We cannot quite match that today. It is not surprising that among his many other distinctions is an honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, or that when Her Majesty the Queen appointed him first a member and then a commander of the Order of the British Empire, Keith had his doubts about the propriety of missionaries accepting such honours. It is to be hoped that he has no such qualms now, as it is our turn to recognise a man who, when he is not overseas, lives a couple of miles away from this hall in Odeby. At this congregation, and in front of so many young people about to start their lives in medicine, he offers us an inspiring model of what can be achieved by one man who has devoted his life to bringing sight and health to thousands in need on the other side of the world. Mr Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present Keith Mortimer Waddle that you may confer on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. I've never, I've, I've never heard a reception like that. Just terrific. Well done. Yeah. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, distinguished visitors, ladies and gentlemen, my Fellow graduands, firstly I would like to thank the university very warmly indeed for this honor, both to myself and to my fellow workers in Africa. We are deeply grateful. I would also like to thank the orator for his very generous uh, speech and about my life and motivation. I just wish I deserved it all. <laughs> also, I want to thank my fellow workers in Africa, without whom I could do nothing. They aren't here, of course, today, but I hope with the net, within a few days, they will see something of this. And so if you, my fellow workers, are out there in cyberspace today, this is for you also. Thank you. My congratulations to my fellow graduands. I vividly remember when I graduated uh, many, many years ago now, 
And although I still call myself qualified and graduated, I'm also proud to boast that this year I am a 60th year medical student. <laughs> You're lifelong learners. See if you can beat 60 years. Now, I appreciate that you, the medical graduates here, are being trained to keep going our wonderful, wonderful National Health Service. But although I did all my training under the NHS, I have worked in these faraway places all my life, as you have heard. And I want, in my very brief few minutes here, to put in an appeal, a plea, for the rest of the world. Uh, I suppose it's slightly subversive propaganda, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> You know, we live in a world that is desperately, desperately unfair. And the benefits we enjoy as our natural rights, especially in healthcare, are just unknown to the two-thirds world, the billions out there who have almost nothing that we have. It's been vividly illustrated recently by the Ebola crisis. Arguably, the most important medical advance that faces us at the present day is not all the glamour projects like personalized genomics or implantable chips, etc., etc. The most important thing is just to bring what we already know and take it to these billions in the two-thirds world so that they can share some of the benefits we already have. But I'm also glad to hear, for example, about this research on malaria because malaria is still the number one killer of children in Africa, 800,000 deaths a year. Now, I'm sure if I say this, that... Um, about let's consider the rest of the world as well. Straight away you're thinking what I once thought, well, I want a serious career. I don't want a career in the outback as a dead end, far away from all centers of excellence. Well, I thought like that as well. However, I think I can say the fact that I have the privilege of standing here today is proof that careers work in these far away, harder places are by no means a dead end. Paradoxically, because we start so far behind in the third world, the two-thirds world, the tropics, we have huge, huge space in which to develop services, to develop research, and to make a real, real difference. I was glad that the uh, president spoke of making a difference in training, because that's what we can do. The orator has mentioned several of these things just at the risk of blowing my own trumpet. I'll just go over a few of them. When I went to Uganda, measles was a killing and a blinding disease. Polio was making many people crawl on the floor with withered limbs. Back in the 60s, the vaccines came, we started rolling them out with other people, and now those diseases have gone. In the 70s, in Idi Amin's era, as we have heard, I was in charge of all the leprosy patients in southwest Uganda. I had 5,000 patients. But the new treatment had come, the new antibiotics, multidrug therapy, we started to roll it out 10 years before WHO made it official. And now leprosy has gone from Uganda and many other African countries. Just think of it, this ancient dreaded, dreaded scourge is gone. We're making a dent on maternal and child mortality, which are still terrible figures. And as you've heard, I'm now in eye work. 20 million people in the world blind with cataract. In 10 minutes, in a remote place, we can give them from blindness we can, into normal sight with our lens implant operation. 10 million people with trachoma in pain going blind. The figures are mind boggling. We've got a long way to go, but we're making a dent. Retinoblastoma, you've been hearing about it. The kids no longer all die. We have quite a high success rate with chemotherapy. Now, forgive me for blowing my own trumpet, but I think you get the message. These are not careers, dead end careers, in the backwoods, these can be very, very productive and fulfilling careers. So my congratulations to my fellow graduands, and I wish you the best as you go on to keep our wonderful National Health Service going, but I do hope in coming years we shall also see some of you out in these harder but very, very exciting places. Thank you, and thank you again to the University for the award.